The monolith and Hal represent two opposing ideas about evolution, the central theme of 2001. The monolith represents a mystic or esoteric view of our next stage in evolution, an evolution in consciousness beyond three-dimensional reality, towards an awareness of higher dimensions beyond time and space. Hal represents a purely materialistic notion of evolution, enabled by technology and concerned with human augmentation to overcome all physical and intellectual limitations, including death. These two notions seem to be in direct opposition, stemming from different notions about consciousness and the nature of reality. Let's begin with the technological view of evolution, a school of thought widely referred to as transhumanism. Evolution, as we were taught in school, is an exceedingly slow biological process, although Kubrick depicts the process as cinematically instantaneous, which kind of flies in the face of anyone who says his films are slow. Human evolution is currently estimated to have taken anywhere between two to six million years from our earliest known ancestors to Homo sapiens. Transhumanists believe that we should take it upon ourselves to accelerate the process. Transhumanism is a movement that advocates for the enhancement of human capabilities through technology and includes many possibilities ranging from body modification and superintelligence to life extension and even immortality. Its proponents see the next step in human evolution as being self-engineered, with exponential advances in AI, biotech, and nanotech leading up to a technological singularity, a point where man and machine merge into a new species. And for the better, I should add, the transhumanist attitude towards these developments is entirely positive. Is this depressing? I don't see why it should be. We superseded the Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal men, and we presume we're an improvement. I think we should regard it as a privilege to be stepping stones to higher things. I suspect that organic or biological evolution has about come to its end, and we are now at the beginning of inorganic or mechanical evolution, which will be thousands of times swifter. This is science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke predicting the future of the human race. A few months before this broadcast, Clark was contacted by Stanley Kubrick with the proposition that they collaborate on what would become 2001, A Space Odyssey. Clark serves as a forerunner to the transhumanist movement, and many of the ideas he promoted made it into the film in one form or another. Life extension is hinted at in the form of the Discovery's crew members who are in suspended animation. Clark posited that such a process would be necessary to sustain human life over the great distances traveled when exploring outer space. Practical applications aside, life extension and indeed immortality are a major part of the transhumanist project, which sees death as something to be conquered. And it would appear that Kubrick shared the same interests if you consider this quote from a 1968 interview. It's generally thought that after a highly developed science gets you past the mortality stage, you become part animal, part machine, then all machine, eventually perhaps pure energy. This transhumanist merger of man and machine is suggested by the deliberately robotic performance of actors Keir DeLay and Gary Lockwood as astronauts Dave Bowman and Frank Poole. Their expressionless veneers suggest some sort of artificially conditioned emotional control, hinting at a man-machine merger even without evidence of bionic limbs, enhanced vision, or any other technological augmentation. But the film's big personification of a transhumanist future, of course, comes in the form of HAL 9000, supercomputer, chess hustler, and possibly sentient being. Whether or not HAL is genuinely conscious remains a subject of debate today, a classic symbol for ongoing arguments about artificial intelligence. In the book 2001 A Space Odyssey, Clark portrays Hal as being unquestionably conscious. He writes, Since consciousness had first dawned in that laboratory so many millions of miles sunward, all of Hal's powers and skills had been directed toward one end. The fulfillment of his assigned program was more than an obsession. It was the only reason for his existence. The novel, by its very nature, features an omniscient narrator telling us all about Hal's state of mind, but in the film, there is no omniscient, all-knowing narrator. 
we can only observe from the outside, listening to his voice and guessing as to whether or not he is conscious. Dave agrees. Do you believe that Hal has genuine emotions? Well, he acts like he has genuine emotions. Um, of course, he's programmed that way to make it easier for us to talk to him. But as to whether or not he has real feelings is something I don't think anyone can truthfully answer. Clark, however, is absolutely certain. In the novel, he asserts that Hal is unquestionably capable of thought simply because he passed the Turing test. Debate continues today as to whether or not the Turing test, or any other test for AI, actually proves anything other than how convincingly a computer behaves like a human, which says a lot more about human psychology than it does about sentient machines. Transhumanists generally believe that consciousness is an emergent property of the physical brain, which arises from firing neurons, chemical reactions, and complex information processes. Consequently, a computer that can match or exceed the complexity of the human brain will reach critical mass and attain consciousness. Not only does this idea serve as the foundation for sentient AI, it also supports another transhumanist concept, mind uploading. The idea that your consciousness can be reduced to data and digitally stored or installed into a new body or some entirely new form, thereby attaining immortality. But is consciousness truly a material entity that can be generated, replicated, or transmitted? Let's briefly address this age-old question. What is consciousness? There are numerous ways to approach the question. Materialism and physicalism are philosophical positions that view reality as being ultimately physical and our consciousness as something in the physical world. It's the view of reality that our science is built upon, and it's central to transhumanism. It observes all phenomena, including consciousness, from the outside, objectively, from a third-person perspective. In philosophical opposition to materialism is idealism, which considers consciousness as primary. With all of our experiences, our thoughts, our dreams, and even what we perceive as the physical world, as being entirely dependent on our consciousness. It considers consciousness from the inside, subjective first-person experience. You, or to be slightly more precise, your conscious awareness is watching this video, or you may be just listening to it, as the case may be. Perhaps now, you're thinking about yourself watching it. Maybe now, you're thinking about watching something else or possibly getting a burrito, or another cup of coffee. Whatever the circumstances are, you are the first person witness to your experience, your perceptions, sensations, and thoughts. You don't require any proof that you are a conscious being. It's self-evident. Consciousness is inherently subjective. Science and technology require objective observation, quantitative data, and repeatable experiments. Despite recent advances in cognitive science, neuroscience, and other disciplines that study the external attributes of consciousness, consciousness itself is only experienced from within, which makes scientific conclusions about it not feasible on principle. This is part of what's called the hard problem of consciousness, an idea put forth by philosopher David Chalmers. As a child, Chalmers experienced synesthesia a condition where he would experience music as color. While most music produced brown and green, the song Here, There, and Everywhere by the Beatles made him experience bright red, an experience that demonstrates the gap between external objects and subjective experience. Along similar lines is an influential essay by philosopher Thomas Nagel titled What Is It Like to Be a Bat? which argues against the materialist interpretation of consciousness by outlining the impossibility of knowing the subjective experience of a bat. You can imagine, you can empathize, you might someday even be able to experience the same sensory stimuli, but you cannot know. It's just as impossible as knowing whether or not Hal is truly conscious, all of which brings into question any certainty about a technological singularity. It also suggests an entirely different notion of human evolution 
one that has more to do with the expansion of consciousness and less to do with the physical body, brain included, with or without technology. One that Kubrick goes all in on in the final section of 2001. After Hal murders a bunch of crew members and is soundly lobotomized, our expressionless hero, Dave Bowman, embarks on a nonverbal odyssey through the cosmos of signs and symbols, the most notable one being the monolith, our guide through this experience. The film at this point completely abandons narrative convention in favor of pure experience. The first two thirds of 2001 are structured in a way where the viewer is a third person observer watching some action play out from the outside. This is the way most movies function. The closing section of 2001 does not work the same way. Not only is it an example of non-narrative filmmaking, it's also highly abstract and immersive. The non-verbal ape drama of the Dawn of Man sequence is conventional and easy to understand by comparison. Shifting gears in this way, Kubrick transforms the objective third-person watcher of events into a puzzled first-person experiencer of sight and sound. When 2001 was released in 1968, the idea of consciousness expansion had already overtaken the zeitgeist, fostered by the growing popularity of Eastern mysticism and hallucinogenics. Although Kubrick declared himself to be an atheist a number of times, at least where organized religion and anthropomorphic gods are concerned, there are also indications that he held a lifelong interest in metaphysics and esoteric ideas, although they're largely anecdotal. In Monica Furlong's biography of author and lecturer Alan Watts, she mentions in passing that Kubrick was introduced to LSD during his time in Hollywood by experimental psychologist Oscar Janiger. But more important than scrounging for clues to Kubrick's personal beliefs is to simply look at the film, which communicates in a manner closer to esotericism and mysticism than to any rules you'll find in a screenwriting textbook. Kubrick deliberately foregoes direct language in favor of metaphor. A finger pointing at the moon, as Zen Buddhists say. Since we can't actually describe a condition that we haven't evolved far enough to fully comprehend, we can only suggest and intuit utilizing symbols. Kubrick confirmed this approach in a 1968 interview. I tried to create a visual experience, one that bypasses verbalized pigeonholing. I intended the film to be an intensely subjective experience that reaches the viewer at an inner level of consciousness. You're free to speculate as you wish about the philosophical and allegorical meaning of the film. Thanks, Stanley. Please allow me to speculate momentarily. The monolith is usually seen as a teaching tool, a piece of technology left by an advanced ancient alien intelligence. A less narratively literal way to look at the monolith is to see it as a solid black doorway to higher states of being, a portal paradoxically standing in our own limited 3D space as a 3D object. The book bears this out when Bowman declares, the thing's hollow, it goes on forever, and oh my God, it's full of stars. Near the end of the film, the monolith is seen as part of this celestial configuration, an image that really feels like a direct reference to several esoteric traditions. The overall image can be seen as consisting of seven layers. The number seven happens to be significant to many esoteric traditions, and the image corresponds to several different systems. You could superimpose the seven chakras over it, or the seven planes of existence. Looking at the alignment in this manner, the lowest entity in the frame represents material reality, the lowest vibrational frequency, dense matter, the physical world. The orb at the top of the frame would represent the highest level of pure consciousness, an ineffable condition if you can even call it a condition, from which all things emanate, and which we are evolving back towards. Another symbol with conceptual similarities is the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, and the monolith really comes into play when this symbol is superimposed over Kubrick's image. The bottom sephirot 
represents the material world, and the top represents that which the human mind cannot comprehend, but from which the universe is born. In between, sort of where the monolith would sit, is the abyss. If you look up images of the Tree of Life online, you will sometimes find what looks to be another sephirot called Dat, bridging the abyss. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it isn't. Though it's not one of the ten sephirot, it is sometimes referred to as the invisible or hidden sephirot. Just like the now you see it, now you don't nature of Dat, the monolith can be seen rotating in galactic alignment until it gets to an angle where it seems to vanish completely. The most common definition of dot is consciousness, subjective awareness. The camera then tilts up past this esoteric diagram and into a new set of cinematic symbols pointing the way to the ineffable and the infinite. Perhaps this is the ultimate process of evolution, not the technological approach which had to be deactivated. Perhaps evolution must be made with conscious effort from within. Did Kubrick intend 2001 to be read this way? As with all things Kubrick, who the hell knows? There are plenty of indications that Kubrick was enthusiastic about the technological possibilities affecting the human condition. In interviews, he expressed interest in life extension and immortality. Maybe he's been in cryogenic hibernation since 1999. At the same time, Kubrick presents us many warning signs regarding the implementation of transhumanist ideas. Hal's all-seeing eye and his dominant position in the lives of the Discovery's crew is an example of the surveillance society, which is very much a reality today. Frank and Dave's work life and leisure time have merged into one as they exist in a sort of work panopticon, a dystopian existence which may soon accelerate in the form of bossware. Daily life in such a system could prove to be pretty depressing. Luckily, transhumanist philosopher David Pierce envisions the eradication of pain and suffering via nanotech and genetic engineering. Kubrick seems to have a negative opinion of technological modifications to human psychology in A Clockwork Orange with the portrayal of the Ludovico technique. How will the new technology be distributed? Who gets to be superhuman or immortal? Perhaps this will be achieved the same way that humanity is rescued from nuclear annihilation in Dr. Strangelove, with global elites spawning a eugenically incubated new Eden. Maybe these two visions of evolution aren't mutually exclusive. Maybe technology, properly managed, can assist us in the evolution of our consciousness. In writing this essay, I did some of my research with the assistance of ChatGPT, which was quite helpful, and yet still prone to giving me information that I could not verify, and in some cases was simply wrong. I had to rely on my own judgment and not simply believe the machine. Perhaps we can work on our consciousness while ensuring that technology remains a tool and not our master. Maybe it's too late. Or maybe the whole thing is completely out of our hands.